and I'm passing it over to you. And I want to introduce Sharon Katz. Sharon um, is actually a, a mother to uh, a grown man with Angelman syndrome. And all right, did it pop over, Sharon? It did. Thank okay. you. Hi, I'm Sharon Katz, and I'm a psychiatric um, nurse practitioner, and uh, as well as a clinical nurse specialist. I also do marriage and family therapy, and I am. Let me go to the next slide. You'll see my bio a little bit. This is a personal process for me um, because I've been very involved with Angelman syndrome. Um, originally, back in the day that we were first discovering ourselves that our son, who is now 27, had Angelman's. Really, Angelman syndrome was in a, a toddler stage, not the infancy of the discoveries of things, but toddler and growing into a preschooler kind of stage of development. And so sitting around and talking to some of the scientists, uh, you know, me being from a psychiatric nursing background, my husband being a physician as well, um, we always had the opportunity to spend time with uh, some of the scientists, and we actually met Harry Angelman, and we were very close. We were very close for a while with Audrey Angelman before she passed on. But uh, we learned a lot of the earliest process and the and the struggles of understanding. So in many ways, I've um, seen the the growth and development of this um, disorder. And it's inspired me in, in my own way of growth and in, in my own uh, way. Um, and now by treat, I also treat developmental disabilities and as well as psychiatric needs. So I have a lot of um, uh, background that I can lend you, understand what you're going through because I've been through it. It's very difficult sometimes, but this will give you an understanding of how to cope, especially at this time of year with um, uh, uh, dealing with a developmental disability and surviving it um, because in many ways we really don't have a choice and we have to persevere and it's how do you survive it, how do you cope as, a, as an individual, how do you cope as a family, how do you help mother, how do you help uh, Marshall as a, as a, uh, a family member, uh, the support you need. And that's really where I, I want to focus on today is how, how are we going to, how do you cope? And so in understanding how to cope with the developmental disabilities and understand how to um, uh, figure out where you're going with your life, um, it's important to take a deep breath and understand this is going to be a lifelong journey and you can't just stop because you're tired. But you, yes, that brings another emotional issues that come along and you need to make the next steps happen. There are going to be some good days, there are going to be some bad days. Sometimes they don't seem to equal each other in, in the context that you're looking for. Um, like It seems like you're struggling more on most years. But when you look back in your life, you'll see that you grew because of those hard times of trying to figure out what to do and how to do it. And you have to remember, every time it gets bad, it will get better. Part of it of being bad is you have to recognize what is bad and what you need to do to make it better and breaking it down and understanding how your child is developing through the process that they're learning. And it might take longer, but it's a developmental process that they then grow out of and you just don't have predictability as most other children did. <laughs> Our children are, oh, excuse me, our children are very different people. They're different developmentally, they're different in the way that they communicate, and they're different in the way that they relate to other people. And you don't necessarily know ahead of time how they're going to act, how they're going to be in five years or in ten years, but you have to persevere through that. Um, they have unique but similar qualities. Just because an Angelman child doesn't talk and is a difficult child to um, raise, it doesn't mean that he's not a value in so he, he or she is not a value in society. So there's a lot of things that you need to look at and, and feel so that you can get through that. 
um, you might not relate to the, your child's imperfections, but you yourself are learning to adapt and then teaching other people how to adapt to their qualities. And you are their communicator in a lot of circumstances that other people are not in. And nobody will understand them like you do. And a lot of our children do bring out the best qualities in other people. Let me just get to the next slide. Okay. So developing a stability, trying to find your way through a stable world, how to figure out how to live um, living life without the support of, uh, that the other people in the world might have is difficult. And the, well, let's break it down into family, and then we're going to do community, and then we're going to do government, and then we're going to do um, the global picture. Finding, developing stability in the family, a lot of people don't understand. A lot of um, your uh, relatives do not understand what's wrong with a child and they might not understand how your child is similar to other kids with Angelman. And the Angelman Syndrome walkathons have really been very helpful in helping the um, families to get through the process to, to uh, understand where we're going, what we're doing um, science-wise, but also how other children um, of the same age and stage really are similar to our children. And by involving your family members in the walkathon process brings them to a new graduation of life. I remember many years ago, my parents were very adamant about the fact that I didn't know what I was talking about when it came to um, developmental disabilities and that, sure, it isn't a developmental disability, it's a nutritional problem, I'm just not feeding him correctly. So we, my mother was on a mashed potato diet focus and I'm like mom that's not it <laughs> you know it's just different than what you think and it's never going to be the way you think it is because you're not looking at the science of it um, the way the brain works ha is very mysterious and until uh, 1990s we didn't have very clear understanding about the pathways of the brain and the, and the way that the brain works and since then we've 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 navigated ourselves to a much higher degree of understanding and a lot of the things that, that go on with Angelman children um, do need medications to control their, their uh, seizures, to control their, their behaviors, to do other things. So by getting a professional's opinion about what medications are appropriate for your child and to calm them down and keep them sleeping, and then getting them focused in the morning and getting them um, most functional at a young age, um, you will then be able to get the best function out of your child and he will be he or she will be very grateful because it'll give more independence long term. We've done a lot of work within the Angelman family to try to negotiate where we're going with that and it's important to understand that there are some professionals that are out there in the community that can help you but in your immediate community it might be harder to find and that is something important but the your family stability is one area then your doctors and your professionals and the Angelman Foundation is very um, attuned to and they're developing the um, they now have the clinics that are available in different parts of the country that actually give you good uh, access to some people who have uh, specialty knowledge and the new one just opened at the Mayo Clinic but there's one up in Boston, I think there's one in North Carolina, one out in California. I don't know if that's the full list. Maybe Sheila can tell me eventually when we talk about that later in discussion. But um, so there's a there's a professional balance that can help develop your stability and your family's stability and trusting the knowledge that you have. Explaining this to friends and friends will also help develop your stability. Because, well, other people say, my I, I need to go to a doctor's appointment. Can my child have a play date with your child? You can't do that that easily. Okay, You need to find other people that you can rely on, whether or not that's somebody you pay, have a, a child care worker or somebody on your side, to help with your care. Um, and giving it consistently will give you a break. And that is a very valuable break to have. Um, so what I'm talking about is in, involving friends or finding babysitting or 
finding caretaking child care even when they're up into their upper years, like um, even when they're even older, it helps them. Um, it helps you, and it takes a lot of pressure off of you if you can get away and develop your own stability. Because if you're not stable, your child, your family is not going to be stable. Your marriage isn't going to be stable. And it's important to develop those next steps with people to understand that you have to enjoy your life as well. Your friends might appear as if they have easy lives and perfect families. You have to understand that it, what I, I see so many people in my life. I mean, it, it, clinically, um, I, I see a lot of patients, and um, nobody's life is perfect. It's not because you, you have a child with a disability that your life isn't perfect. It's nobody's life is perfect, and it's through the challenges that we all face and, that people actually grow to be better families and stronger families. Um, the siblings of the Angelman children, um, when they come together and they, they have time at conferences to talk, they grow and understand that they're they're doing a good job. They're they're getting their kudos from their peers, saying, you know, we we had these bad problems. You know, okay, our kid smeared feces on the wall, and my kid, my friend was around, and it was really embarrassing. It was a horrible day, and everything went wrong. Um, kids go to those extremes, and they talk about those bad things when they talk to other siblings with kids who with with that have um, Angelman syndrome. So it's nice to have the link with between siblings with other peers, but it's also important for you to recognize that your friends might not be telling you about all the other mistakes in their lives and all the other issues that come up with their children is no child is perfect and no family is perfect so they don't tell you or the family that looks perfect and they have the perfect time and they have all the money that they need and they go away on vacation and they have a great time and their kids look so perfect you'll see <laughs> nobody escapes this it's part of the karma of life and you'll see eventually that life will go on for them as well but they'll face those challenges when those kids get older and they have other issues and then they have to deal with those because it's a natural process of understanding that we all have struggles and obstacles. Ours are a little bit more obvious and it might be a little bit harder for us to cope with but it's okay. We all get through it and so, some uh, I've heard many people talk to me about having um, witnessed um, watching me as a mother um, and the way I manage my children, my, my three boys, and um, um, so they, they work um, well together and understand what they need, um, but our children have to grow together and understand that we're not perfect as parents, as mothers. I was not a perfect mother. And I always felt that I didn't give my children exactly what I needed to, you know, the extra time. We didn't go to the museums. We didn't go to the, the um, you know, fragile places. We didn't go to, uh, I didn't, I couldn't take my, I didn't go to all the concerts that they were in and um, didn't get a chance to go to every everything that they wanted me to be at. But they survived and actually they, they did fine. And they understood that not everybody could be there all the time for them. So they grew up and they became more independent. And I think that because of that, we we have an idea of what is a good parent and how to be there in as quality. But the you don't need to feel as if your life is going to fall apart because of Angelman syndrome. Um, so many people have told me. I remember when Seth was in ninth grade, and I took him, and I did this, and. Uh, and he, he, I felt so grat. I felt so great. It was such a grateful experience being there for him and doing this with him. And that was somebody I asked to take him to the park so I could have a break. So they enjoyed that. They engaged it, and it changed their life in a, in a small way. And I'll tell you a story later on. Um, but emotionally, you need to understand your stability is the most important piece. Um, if you can't find the balance, then ask somebody to help you. You know, you you know, you know, just don't see it. You don't see how you can balance your life better and talk about it. So that's part of the stability. Now, getting this stability from your government, everybody has different state governments, and we are reliant on our state government to understand that they 
uh, have a level of responsibility to help, help us through the, the challenges. And I hope that we figure out some of these state budgets a little bit better so that the, the needs are taken care of. But there are services. Since our kids um, um, qualify for more severe developmental disability services, take advantage of it. Um, even if financially you're um, uh, up, up in the high pay grade of the 1%, find a way to just make sure people in the society that you live in understand that you have a developmentally disabled challenge and that if something happens to you, this is a challenge that everybody has to deal with. So um, understand that registering and getting Medicaid waivers, getting things in, into the process, even if you don't use them, is a way of developing stability of knowledge of what happens if. And that's where we're, we, we can, um, as a group, provide you a little bit of a, a push to engage those things. You have to do a lot of things yourself, but definitely figure out how to get the, the community support. It's not just about your school district providing education. It's about waiver programs and other things that your state needs to do. To do. Seth lives in a, um, in a group home at this point, and he's doing very well because we provided a lot of the uh, ongoing uh, and early intervention and early monitoring of his progress. Okay. So take care of the caretaker. Um, we know that caretakers, um, unfortunately with best intentions, um, take care of their, their, the person that they're taking care of so well. But the problem we have is we don't take care of ourselves. We're always the last on the list um, for people who, who um, get what they're, what they're looking for. Um, you're living an uncharted life. You don't know what's going to happen next week. But does anybody? Um, you don't know what happens with Angelman children down the line, but yes, now we do. We have longitudinal studies. We have understandings about what works and what doesn't work with schools, with, with providing um, education and communication support. And so we're getting a lot better at chartering and figuring out what the, um, um, how, to, how to help you and understand what your expectations should be like. Um, but you're living a life, and sometimes the unknown creates more anxiety for people. And so you have to learn to find other, this is what I did at, at the last, originally from the very beginning of the Angelman Walks, I would tell friends that I would meet at the Angelman Walks, um, find somebody a few years older in the same sex as your child and pair with that family so that you understand what their challenges were so you don't have to repeat them and you know their resources. And when you have that, it's like a template, but you also can look at other people's templates, and you can, you know, not every child is the same, that's for sure, especially with these kids. Um, but it gives you some resources that you might not have had, or it might give you a chance to say, okay, who did you talk to as an advocate to get where you wanted to go, with schooling or with, with care, and what can we do to make it less emotionally taxing, so that we as caretakers can. Um, um, understand um, and balance again what we need to balance. Um, there's a lot of things that we need to do to look at the ways to make your life happier and healthier. Just because you're taking care of other people doesn't mean that you shouldn't be exercising. You shouldn't be controlling your diet. You shouldn't be controlling your own health. Always keep up with your, your health because what happens to you is very valuable to your whole family. So exercise, diet, good nutrition, and if you feel like your energy, which is my next point, is low, take a look at why your energy is low. Um, are you depressed? Are you anxious? Do you have a vitamin deficiency? Um, do you have other things that are going on like diabetes or hypertension that are giving you physical problems? And this is something typical that goes on as we grow older, but because the stress that you're under because of caretaking, you're find, we are finding that people do have more issues with their energy level and their health. So keep an eye on some of the issues that are going on and how they, they deplete your energy um, in general. And the first way to look at it is looking at your sleep. Now a lot of our children, actually most of our children, have sleep disorders. 
and which is not unusual. Um, Angelman syndrome, a lot of re restlessness at night, waking up, uh, needing to go to the bathroom, sometimes peeing in their bed or whatever, um, having some issues with sleep. You need to get good night's sleep. One way or another, you need to get a good night's sleep. Um, and I don't advise medication. I, inv I, I think that that sedates and, and, and Ambien and um, some of the other hypnotic medications like um, uh, like uh, Lyric, uh, Linesta, uh, and even Restoril, Trazodone, some of the other sleep medications might sedate you too much. I don't encourage people to use Ativan to sleep or Lorazepam, uh, which is Lorazepam, or other things to sleep because it might sedate you too much during the night. You might not wake up for your child if that's what's necessary. Um, but meditating before you go to bed, using melatonin, using anything that can be mild might be very helpful. If it is anxiety that you have, yes, some of the, um, some of the benzodiazepams like lorazepam might be prescribed, but try not to rely on it every night. It does prevent you from having, um, it does help you with your sleep, but it does alter other things. And we, long term, there's studies that, that show that it contributes to other brain dysfunctions. So try to find nor natural sleep. And if not, find ways to meditate and relax during the day. Um, even if it's after you put the children down, taking some time for yourself, closing your eyes, taking some deep breaths, doing some yoga, some relaxation work, um, will go a long way for you to be able to get back into some normal rhythm. Always find a way to maintain your own identity as a person, as a uh, a family member, be, be the sister or the, or the brother that you always wanted to be, be the friend that you want to be, find time for the girls, find time for the girlfriends and the boyfriends and the, what you want to do in life because you need a future as well. And my favorite part of my life has, has become the balance that I struck between my, my relationship with my husband, my relationship with my children, and my relationship with my work. And when that continued to balance itself out, when my son moved into a group home, I was able to get the support I needed. I was able to get the, um, uh, not only the emotional support, but the physical support. And people asking about him in his, in his own, in how I was able to move on with it, and how they were able to cope with the fact that I, my identity really is the same even though I, I had my son move into a different place. So it made life move on naturally, just like everyone else's life. But by maintaining my own identity, I didn't fall into a pit of emotional despair, not having my identity, because my identity is not my children, my identity is me and what I decided to do with my life. Now that's not, that might be true that I met a lot of women and men who invest themselves wholly into their family and really do evolve, but that's not really healthy for those children. And by you being more um, focused on the identity of what you want to do, it gives the children an idea of who their identity is. And one of the things we did for Seth this year is we actually blew up a, some pictures of his family and, and all the people and put it in a composite picture for the wall of his room. Um, so he always has us there now. Um, and it's a beautiful picture. I'm really happy about what we did. But it also showed that he had an identity with us. And that's also very important because our children do have an understanding of who they are. They see themselves in a mirror and they do want to see pictures of themselves. They want to take pictures. They want to look at pictures. So they're identifying themselves and understanding who they are then helps us be better people. So the next thing is when you're looking at the care of the caregiver, and I want to make sure that you understand that um, there's an aspect of life that we fall into, and it's, a, it's about understanding what natural depression and natural anxiety is about. And years ago, there was a, an Angelman conference, it was an international Angelman conference, which I spoke at, which I talked specifically about the role of depression and the role of anxiety in coping with Angelman syndrome. And in that discussion, which was very interesting because it was in, in Tampere, Finland, and it was in the middle of the afternoon, but it was the dark, 
in a dark auditorium, we discussed the fact that, um, and it was a, it was question and answers as well, just similar to this, where I spoke and then people talked, um, um, where we talked about how depression actually has a role in slowing us down and making us think about our abilities and our differences. It's, there's a natural process of, of slowing us down and saying, wait, I can't handle this. What do I need to do differently? But there is a physiologic depression that's different, that actually has more of a disease state, which if you don't treat it, you're going to find yourself burying yourself further and further under the sand and never quite getting anywhere. And the struggles that you're getting through in a, in a, in a, in a, um, a sand pit you're, you're, you can't get out of. And without the physiologic help that you, of a therapist or a medication or a psychiatrist, and not, not to be afraid of that because that actually might open up a better coping. It actually might open up the door of, to things that you have not been able to see, have not been able to feel, and understand what you need to do next. So these are the questions I want you to ask yourself. During the past two weeks, how many days have you had little interest or pleasure in doing things? Have you enjoyed your life? Have you forgotten how to? Are you crying every morning? That's the first topic. The first one is little pleasure or interest in doing things. Is it every day? Is it more than half the days? Is it some days? Is it not at all? The second question, do you feel down, depressed, or helpless, or hopeless? How often? Every day? More than half the days, some days, not at all. Okay. Trouble falling asleep, trouble staying asleep, not being woken from sleep, but you naturally being restless and waking yourself up. That's a sign of depression. Or the opposite, sleeping too much. If you're sleeping too much and never seem to get enough energy, there might be something wrong that you need to talk to your primary care doctor about. The fourth one, feeling tired or having little energy, the same thing I just said. Um, talk to your primary care doctor, you might have something else, else wrong, but you, if you have no energy, there are medications we can give you that will give you that energy back, and it balances off your depression. The fifth question, poor appetite or overeating. We self-satisfy by eating. It's a sign of self-medication to yourself. So, And we also restrict, we forget to eat when we're depressed. So this is a sign of it. Once again, is it every day, more than half the days, several days, or not at all? It, don't generalize. If it happens once, don't say it happens every day. Well, okay, then why are you obese if you haven't been eating? So, you know, it's just like, okay, eat the wrong things the wrong time of day. And am I binge eating? So you got something to talk to your doctors about or your, your health care providers. Um, the sixth thing is do you feel bad about yourself? Do you put yourself down? Do you feel as if you're letting other people down? Once again, is that every day? More than half the days? Some days. The seventh thing, having problems concentrating. That's a sign of depression, but it's also a sign of attention deficit disorder. It's a sign of you not being able to put the next things together. And we have and if you're changing medications or doing something wrong, uh, something in your life that's causing that, it could be caused by something else. But Trouble concentrating is a sign of depression. Psychomotor retardation or slowness um, or hyperactivity. Um, do you move too slow and people have noticed? Having a hard time spitting out the right words and people have said, whoa, what's going on? You're not talking as, as fluently as usual. You're really sluggish. There's something going on in your life. Um, or the opposite, ba -ba 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 -ba, speaking too quickly, having a great time. Um, all that rush, 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 that might be a sign of bipolar disorder. Speaking too fast, or it might be a sign of anxiety. So it's understanding, you know, where that is. But it is a sign of depression when you have variations in that. And the ninth question is very important. Have you been having thoughts of suicidal? You know, is life worth living? Why am I here? I'd be better off dead. Or desire to harm yourself or harm somebody else. If you answer yes to that and that's a pervasive thought, you have to talk to somebody. You can't let yourself go. You can't let yourself get to the, to the worst case scenario at that point. So it's important for you to, to make the next step and call a healthcare provider. 
okay, especially with depression. Now, depression is a treatable dis disease, and it goes in through remission. So it, once you get the some insight into it, you can conquer it through therapy, or you might need some medication. And there's a lot of different medications. They have different kinds of side effects. If you have sexual side effects, if you have la lack of interest or libido, or have problems performing sexually, tell your healthcare provider. Don't wait for them to keep asking them to, to ask that question. A lot of people don't want to ask that question. A lot of providers don't. But if it is, they can switch the medication. It's not that hard to something that actually will be better for you. Okay. Now, the other thing is self-assessment is anxiety. And as I mentioned about my my speech, what I gave it, my, my, um, I spoke at the Angelman Conference in, in Tampere, Finland, Anxiety helps give you that mobilization. Normal anxiety is normal in society, normal with you. Your fear factor comes in, and your it gives you the mobilization. It gives you the quickness to think of other possibilities. And sometimes that's normal and productive, and sometimes it's wrong, and it's actually destructive. Okay, so to figure that out, ask these questions. These are the these are the other questions that we ask about anxiety. Do you how often do you feel nervous, anxious, or on edge? Is it every day, or is it half the days, or is it just sometimes? Do you have the ability to stop or control your worrying? Is the next question because if you're perseverating about those worry, that one worry over and over again, and not being able to stop it, saying put it down, turn the channel, move on. If you can't con stop or control that worry, it's going to dominate your life and everything you think about. The next thing is the opposite, a little bit different, multiple worries and racing thoughts. If you're having one anxiety after another anxiety after another anxiety, you're not going to have a productive life. You're not going to be able to take care of your children. So we have to find ways to slow down those racing thoughts and stop having multiple worries because they're not necessary. The secret to balance is not worrying about all the world's problems and learning to take one thought at a time and not having it dominate your sleep or dominate your, your evening hours when you have time for yourself. The fourth one is trouble relaxing. If you have problems relaxing after your children relax and go to bed and you then have problems falling asleep and you have problems with restlessness and relaxing, you're going to have a, a very difficult time sleeping. You're going to have a very difficult time during the day with your energy, a variety of things. So there's a balance to that. And then you have to worry about the restlessness um, because that also then triggers feeling easily annoyed or irritated, your anger level, being snappy with the kids. That feeds a whole cycle of anxiety in your family. So stepping back from that and understanding what you can do to prevent that is very key to where your life pro productivity would be and how your children then cause trouble for you. Um, when I stopped becoming irritable and annoyed easily with my children, my kids became very calm. They then listened. They then became listening to other people, doing better in school, and a variety of other things fell into place. Raising kids without yelling and screaming is very hard, but it's very good for everybody's well-being, including you. So try to find ways to back away from that anxiety and display it towards them and acting out towards them. And if you have a hard time controlling that, there's other things that we have to think about psychiatrically that might be causing your irritability. And it could be dealt with in psychotherapy with understanding what why you feel as if you're not getting what you need in life and why you always have to be irritated. It also could be part of your personality. Um, there's also projective anxiety, the fear that some something awful would happen. This is um, uh, always worrying what's going to happen if my son gets sick or, uh, you know, um, will he go to the right place? What, what, is, are they going to know what to do? And projecting it to the worst case scenario, they can't go out because nobody's going to nobody's going to know what, how to handle him, and that anxiety is counterproductive to life because then you're not living. So you have to find ways to make the next step each time and live your life in in the most productive ways. And finding the right balance 
is very key to the world that you live in and we you know understanding that you need to advocate for your own needs you need to learn to open up to others and ask for what you are looking for and recognize that nothing is perfect recognize that nutrition and sleep are very key to finding the balance that you are looking for and count your blessings there's a lot of benefits of life with an Angelman child, but sometimes you just don't see it. Um, they make you different as a family, and they help you cope with other things in life that you wouldn't have thought that you could cope with. They also bring to other people some things that are very valuable in them. And look into yourself about what you've learned in the process of raising this your children because you yourself never, probably never expected to raise a child with Angelman syndrome. And it's a, not a, a horrible thing, but the truth is it's hard. It's a very hard process to learn how to raise a child who, who doesn't talk for themselves or behave and won't be as independent with themselves. So try to look at yourself and how you're then also mentoring the, your child, mentoring your family, and mentoring other people who are also then two years or five years or ten years behind you learning how to cope with things because we do learn from us from this you're probably growing as a person but you need to recognize it and feel the feelings that you need to do and last lastly I want to tell you is a story about perspective perspective comes with time and um, I, I recently had a um, a uh, young man come, who was 24 years old, 23 years old, come back to my office, come into my office for, for a first time visit. And he told me a story that was very remarkable. And I didn't realize it at the time because it was just too, too amazing for me. Um, um, he happened to um, tell me that um, what he's, very, he's been depressed recently. And I said, well, when the last time you, you, you know, you've had depression before? He said, yes, I've been depressed. I was depressed in high school. I remember being in high school. And um, I, I did therapy, but therapy didn't help. Uh, and I decided that there was a tragedy in this school, and they, they needed to, uh, I needed to cope with it. And so they assigned me to the autistic support class. And I paired up with um, some children in that, that class, and I went to Special Olympics, and I had a great time. And it really opened up my eyes to, I'm depressed, and I'm dealing with these autistic and spectrum disorder children who won't be who don't feel the depression but they what am I to complain about he was basically getting to who am I to say about depression it really helped me through and when he got depressed in in college he went to counseling and he he also realized that his focus was he needed to go back and, and become an autistic support specialist and he got a young childhood education degree and now he's teaching autistic uh, autistic children and now he's coming back because, because he's depressed because his girlfriend's not with him and he's having some problems and struggles with his identity as a man and fi fi figuring out where he's going and that's what's overwhelming him now and after I figured out what's wrong I gave him a prescription and I, I closed up my computer and I said I said I know you're in autism support have you ever heard of Angelman syndrome and he looked at me deer in the head like look and he said whatever happened to Seth and I'm like what do you mean and I said well whatever happened you mentioned Angelman syndrome and I said he's my son and I said what happened and I said I said did you know that he was my son and I said no and I said oh and I said he's fine he's great and I said well the last time I saw him was in his in the high school gym at my prom and I never have seen him since and it was something that stimulated me to go into autistic support specialty and it affected me so much because I went through Special Olympics with him I did the I took him around the school we used to fold towels together and go do the various things for the school and develop he had this whole routine that he worked out with him and he's then been able to do this for a long time and yet he was never able to thank my son and that was so touching because you never know what the value our children have in the lives of others and so many people have said that to me so I'm going to open it up for other people we can talk we have another 20 minutes we can use more we can use less depending on what you guys want okay 
I'm going to Thanks. throw it back to you. <laughs> Thanks, Sharon. Um, I'm, uh, I got a little teary-eyed there, I'm not going to lie. And I, you told me that story before, but I still got teary-eyed. Um, we, right now, there's no questions that have come through. But if anybody has, let me just check the chat real quick. If anybody has any questions, go ahead and type them into your questions box. Um, anything that you want to ask Sharon or myself. Um, and if you think of something afterwards, you can go ahead and send an email to info at angelman.org. And we'll go ahead and uh, send that off to Sharon to, to answer if she can. Um, so go ahead. We'll just give you a couple more minutes. <clears throat> Excuse me. It's always hard to figure out what people really want to know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, in in general, um, I hope that this was helpful. Um, I think that it's always hard to look back and understand um, what helped me or somebody else because you don't want to say the global me. It's not about me. It's about what I've seen in other people too, and. Um, the hundreds, if not thousands, of angelman children that I've seen in my lifetime, all are very unique and also very similar. And their families all have different agendas and uh, different approaches, um, but at the same time, very similar. Because we basically, biologically, all have the same struggles. Uh, they just manifest different ages and stages in different ways, and each time you see them, um, it takes a, takes a minute back and say, oh my gosh, who am I? Um, what am I doing? Do I need to do something different? Um, and we learn from each other. So the process of learning, um, what I've learned from people in my community with Angelman in, in this region, um, help me cope with the government agencies and the school districts and the um, developing um, child care support so that we could get away and not get overwhelmed. Um, I think that that was key. Um, having the buddy system of, that I explained. Um, and I didn't have to have really close relationships with the people that I looked towards, but just know that we're in the same community. And the truth is our um, agencies that the school agencies can't provide other names of other people that are also in the same situation unless there's permission given. But you definitely, if you go to the same camps, you start seeing the same people in the same groups and you get to know the same parents. And then you see them a few years later and then you say, well, oh wow, we wound up at the same agency. We wound up at the same uh, uh, sheltered, sheltered uh, workshop. We wound up in the same group home situation. We wound up with the same uh, various things. So you have a lot of different things that come up. So it's, it's pretty interesting. We'll see. Yeah, so I did have a question come through, and I don't know if I'll get all of these um, medications right, but I'm going to try. Okay, so her daughter is 15 years old, deletion positive. She is taking lamactyl, sonosamide. Um, Ativan, melatonin, baclofen. She currently is having aggressive behavior, behavior, and the doctors want to give her one milligram of Tenex. Um, what are your thoughts? Tenex? Yeah. Oh, that's good. Okay. Tenex. Okay. Um, Tenex is also called Intunov. Um, it's for ADHD, but the best thing about it is you give it at night, and it's sedating. And I, I prescribed it last night to somebody. Um, that doesn't have Angelman syndrome. Um, he had um, uh, another another atypical um, developmental issue, um, and uh, and he's like 16, so it's the same age group. And I and I use it a lot. We use it for oppositional defiant disorder. It's actually um, in the I'm trying to think if it's one of the ones that are in the category of blood pressure medications. Um, originally, a lot of the old blood pressure medications like Minipress. Um, didn't really uh, help with the blood pressure, but it did help sedate and calm down the brain waves. So it stopped the anxiety at night. So I think that that's a really good thing. Um, I didn't hear the whole, I, I heard Lamictal, which was the first one. That's a mood stabilizer, and I definitely endorse that. Um, I actually did some research recently about Lamictal, and it um, has a control aspect that, um, 
really helps with the impulsivity of the behaviors, plus it balances off the highs and the lows of the brain waves. So it's a neuroleptic which we use for um, seizure control, but it also can be used um, as a mood stabilizer. It doesn't sedate you, it doesn't have weight gain as a side effect, and it's something which you can really use up to about 200 milligrams, but with children you use about 25 milligrams, and you gradually can go up to like 50. And the main thing with Lamictal is um, you really should watch for a bright red rash. It's called Steven Johnson rash. If you see it, please stop it immediately. Take them to the emergency room. See, and just it is an emergency. It's it's categorized as an emergency, um, and they just want to make sure that um, there's nothing else wrong, and they would just do blood bloods and then discharge you. Um, sometimes it can um, show that there's some other things that are going on with your organs, and they would keep you and flush you out with with that. Uh, Samuel, so, I, I don't know what the second one was. What was the second one, Sheila? Um, sonosamide. At so, well. Well, that's probably for appetite or for um, um, sedation of some sort. I don't know what that one is. What's the third one? Ativan. That's good. Okay. Ativan or any of the benzodiazepam, the whole family of benzodiazepam, uh, calm down the jerky movements. Ativan is a short-acting one, and it doesn't work all day, but it works at the beginning of the day or at night to calm you down. I don't believe in keeping benzodiazepines in short-term version. Aclonopin is a better version. These that works eight hours, 12 hours, and it's better for you. It doesn't have um, ebbs and flows, and it doesn't develop tolerance. Um, while Ativan does, Transine was something that's what that a neurologist taught me about, which is rarely, which is um, something which I, I found with other Angelman kids. Um, probably because my neurologist had a lot of influence on a lot of things, but transient actually helps control the absent seizures, plus it also controls behavior, and that's a very long-acting benzodiazepine, um, and that way you don't lose, um, it doesn't affect their muscles. Valium is a long-acting benzodiazepine, but I don't endorse that at all with Angelman kids, except for to break seizures, um, because uh, it's a muscle relaxant, and that's not necessarily good for you. And what was the next one after Ativan? At least that's the benzodiazepine. Um, melatonin. Melatonin is for sleep, which we use all the time. It's natural. You can use, uh, they come in all sorts of different ranges of doses. Sometimes they, I think it's up to 10 milligrams. Um, three, three to six milligrams is the average dose. Um, they come in three milligrams, four, I've heard four milligrams, five milligrams, six milligrams. I don't usually see it above being given above six milligrams, but literature says that it can be given up to 10 milligrams. So that is regu that regulates the day-night sleep cycle. It helps them uh, relax, but make sure you take it one hour before you want them to go to bed be and, and take it with food because it digests better than that and it relaxes them better, and that's very effective. There was a, mel there was a lot of sleep studies done on our kids back in my kids' early days, so that was like 25 years ago, in which we then found that melatonin works very effectively. And that's when we also learned that the benzodiazepams are much more effective in treating Angelman syndrome than the um, long than the than any any other medications. Um, don't let a doctor prescribe an antipsychotic for our kids unless they are psychotic, unless they're de demonstrating destructive behavior in which they're um, harming themselves. Okay, because if they're harming themselves, not just chewing their fingers, but literally uh, scratching and, and doing that. Um, I wouldn't endorse that at all because benzodiazepines are better for them, and the psychos, the antipsychotics are not as. There's, I don't. I haven't seen any research on that. Um, but attention deficit disorder is something which is common with our kids. We see that all the time. Intuniv or Tenex is um, uh, very good because it helps sedate them, um, and that way you can get a better quality. Um, of sleep. All right, I had another question come in. Um, how do you get over the guilt of leaving your child with a caretaker in order to give their siblings a vacation without their Angelman sibling? Oh, that's a hard one. <laughs> okay, I, I, I have done that many times though. My, my brother-in-law got married in Amsterdam 
and I've gone to weddings in other places, and um, I do not take my child out of the country. Um, you do need to do it, okay? And uh, um, the guilt, you bring back good things, and you take good pictures, and you make them have a special time before you leave, and then after you leave, and plan things while they're away for your caretaker to take them to. Um, it is important um, that they feel as if they're doing something else. Uh, they are aware of the fact that you're away, but it's they also should go away to sleep. They should go away for a week now and then to other places too. So, you know, you have to figure that out. Um, like uh, uh, every once in a while, I would leave my son at a respite for, and they used to play and have movies and have a great time. He never missed me. Um, you know, it gets them ready for the other things in the world. But I've definitely taken my other my other children to. We went to England one year um, because I, I wanted to to show them some cultural things outside of the country. Um, but you know, you you balance it with other things. But it is something which you'll feel guilty about while you're leaving um, or while you're there. But you know, they, they get over it too. They don't they don't have long term memory of, of that. And it's good practice. Okay, does that help? Yeah. Yep. And then just a final question: um, Should angel men children be disciplined differently? Well, they don't understand hitting. Um, I wouldn't say hitting is ever a positive thing for any child. Um, Disciplined? I don't know. That's a that's a tough one. Um, uh, teaching them is hard. Discipline should um, follow what the teachers do at school is what I used to follow. Um, if they have timeouts, if they have other things, um, but they don't understand it. They don't understand taking away television or something. Um, but that you need to teach them no, because like they, they do a lot of pica, they chew things, they have to learn not to. There's other things they have to do uh, to learn, and they have to learn that they have to sit on their hands if they, they're agitated or something. That's something which you can do. The way, best way of discipline is teaching them to sit on their hands, because then they calm down. Um, but that's what I would suggest. Okay? Any other questions? Um, we do have one more. I don't know if you can answer this one or not. Um, how do you start a social group or have them to have some social life? Um, that's interesting because the communities around you, um, the, the thing is you have to find the other people that also are struggling with um, uh, different things. And what we did is um, we found other parents dealing with the same kinds of things, and we planned a day in which we say, let's all go to an amusement park and then let's let's I'll take the let's have movies or something like that. And that's a way to get them to interact. Um, you'll notice that your kids naturally gravitate to certain types of people. Now Seth did become very close friends with um, one other Angelman kid who was named Michael Saunders. And every time and he has a couple other kids that, that are similar and that, that he the minute he sees them he gets very excited. And it's because they went to the same camp. Um, so that's where they first started socializing, and now they're at the same um, workshop during the day, and they all still socialize together. So they really have developed their own social network, but it took us a little while to figure out who would be good where, and it's about inviting the families over to your life, um, or planning something that actually works with the families. So. And then you then you find that the siblings actually get along because then they get a chance to do it. But the best place to find people of, of like mind is really at the Angelman walkathons. Um, that's where we we really felt that there was more gravitation because the kids really liked each other and then they saw each other at camp during the summertime and then they and then it continued during the year. So that's where we we found that um, playtime. But during the winter time, most people don't go out as much, so um, you have to make that effort to have that happen. Okay. Okay, well, thank you so much, Sharon. I know you're super busy, so we, um, thank you for everything. Happy Hanukkah, and thank you guys all for joining us today. Yeah, Merry Christmas to everybody. I hope everybody has a good time. Thank you. Okay. And if not, you can always write in, and we can do another seminar. Okay? <laughs> all right, Bye. thanks, Sharon. Bye. Bye.